And today we continue uh, bloodshed number four, maybe. And uh, uh, so we continue with the story of the bloodshed. And uh, as I'm trying to do the last few classes, I'm trying to remind you or to ever join us that what we are doing is following the text. I'm totally confined, limited by the text. So when I speak on bloodshed, number third of Noah, I completely follow tied to the text of Genesis, which start with uh, uh, the first murder, Cain, killing Abel, and then ending up with uh, Noah and flood, and the rainbow covenant, which is uh, based on bloodshed laws. So the whole section from, from uh, Cain and Abel to Noah is revolving about bloodshed. And as I mentioned before, and to whoever joining us, that uh, this way, before, by following the book of Genesis this way, we saw that uh, chapter one, Genesis introduces God and the uh, Sabbath and the, idolat the idea of the idolatry, which is commandment number one. Then we follow the text, the text actually lead us to to Story of Eden, which is completely revolving around adultery, beside adultery. Adultery, the woman, the snake, talk about it. And the law of adultery is right there in, in Eden. So from idolatry and adultery, you now we move, following the Torah text, and move to bloodshed number three. So we see that Moses actually wrote a book, amazingly, with the seven command or six commandment of Adam on his mind, because he continued with the other commandments, theft, justice, and so on, and blasphemy. So Moses had in mind uh, the six commandment for Adam, when he wrote the book of Genesis. So to whom he was speaking, he was speaking to us. He was speaking to Noah beside Israel. And why, why I'm saying us, I, I'm amazed to say that uh, us means literally us, right? I tell you, I'll tell you why. Because we are the first generation, and think about it, we are the first generation that look at the chapter one, and I mentioned it many times before, we look at the story of, of creation and, and to us in the 21st century, suddenly it looks a real, a real text that to describe perfectly well what we know about creation from, from science. If you want to see how, look at history channel report as I mentioned it in early classes. And you go step by step, you see that Moses followed the, what we know in science perfectly well. So all the previous generation could do that, could, could know that. Rabbi Akiva or any rabbi, even, even the last century, all the sages of the Torah, as great as they are and they were, uh, they offered all kinds of explanation. Chapter one, holy beast, the allegorical, but we, we are the point that we don't, we listen to that, but we don't need it. We have a direct knowledge, not a belief, but direct knowledge. And I talk about what the difference between knowing and believing. I believe in something that I can touch. I, can, I believe the table is here. I may, may or may not be here. But if I say, I know the table is here, then I know it's here. So if I say I know the chapter one is true, I know it because it's not, I don't believe in it. I know it's true because I compare it to, to, to the science and it's perfectly, uh, they do match. So no human being could, could write such a 
Do you do, do we understand when we, when we realize that we stand in awe? Who is a no human being could at the time of Moses could write such a such a, a chapter that they could perfectly match science with the, with the, with the Torah. No, no priest, no king in eighth century. Oh, look what they tell us in the, in the YouTube. They offer all kinds of explanation all the Torah. I want to know who could who could read, who could write such a chapter. Perfect. It's a miracle in our hand. It's perhaps the only miracle that I can touch and say perfectly well. It's a miracle. So it's so because of that. I have the feeling that kind of give me the feeling, and to you maybe also, that uh, Moses actually wrote it to us because he knew that uh, a generation will come, not so soon, but down the road, that we're able to understand what he's writing in a direct way. And who, 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 that, who is that generation? Not in 18th century and not in 19th century and not in the 20th century, only us. And the more we know from science now, quantum, quantum physics and all that, I'm telling you, it's, it's un unravel all kind of mystery of the Torah in a perfectly way that only we now know directly can understand. Okay, that's so, that means that when he writes, the, when he writes this book in, in a perfectly, uh, organized way, moving from one the, from our commandment to the other, it means that Moses had us in our mind, he had you and me and God and all the teachers of this of this community and the person who, who listened to those videos and learned Torah, he saw us and talked to us because we know what he's talking about. It gave me a direct connection to he, to what he's saying. So we are not wasting our time here. We are learning things that, that were given miraculously to Moses. Having said that's enough, and we can move on. And I, I said in the introduction, because uh, uh, I know in the past, many people asked me, Abel, kind, oh, leave me those ancient stories. They are not ancient stories. It's a message given to us from Moses. <clears throat> we, if there is another topic that we, if you ask me, what, what is the historical background of that? Well, you know, there is a whole gap of uh, between 3,500 years BC to 10,000 BC. There's a whole gap that science doesn't know. We only find the only archeological finding like the pyramid, and like those uh, stones in, in Turkey at the, the age of 10,000 years BC, and are perfectly carved out and beautifully, uh, such a high level of science and, and, uh, and uh, technology. And so oh, there's a, certainly there was some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, culture, human culture that uh, was lost. And and is we don't see it anymore. Is it under under Antarctica or any other place? Is it in the ocean? I don't know. But I be, I know that Moses is, is setting us a truth. So something is true in this story. So now that as we move on to discuss the story, uh, the story begins of the first one of Blatchett begins with. Abel, kind killing Abel, ending with Noah. With your permission, I'll do what is not customary. I will start with the end, because I know this is where we, we want to go. So instead of reading the, the chapter step by step, I will go straight to the end to see where we are going. And the end, and the end of the story of the of the of the of course the flood and the rainbow covenant. So Noah is 
sitting in the, in the ark for so many days and he's pondering about what happened. I want to focus on that moment. The middle spirit speaking out. And something bothering him. How did it all happen? How could what bother him is how could such pious generations, the children of Adam and Eve, the first three generations were completely pious. How did suddenly degenerate into such horrible society that uh, transgressed all the laws possible, especially the excel in bloodshed, excel in, in, in adultery, and so, so also adultery. They didn't do adultery of the wood and stone. They had their own kind of idolatry, I will tell you, to speak about. It. But they transgressed all of them. How could they do such a, 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 a stupid thing or unexpected, what you say, unexpected thing and deteriorated and slided, slid down the slopey wall from one commandment to the other until they violated all of them? How do, uh, he knew, of course, he knew what the sin of the, of, of the generation was. How do I know that he knew that? The text show, shows that. The text shows that, uh, that he saw, he had a vision before the, before, the, before the flood. He saw the heavenly court. And, and it's, it's here in a text. And I want to show you the text. So don't think that I'm speaking from, from my mind. So I'll, I'll try to share with you. Okay. So here is the text. Here is the text from, from Genesis before the flood. Okay. So he is sitting, he knew that before the before he entered the ark. You see the blue. The two heavenly, the two heavenly attributes appear to him. Blue first by HVH, you see it here. Then Elohim in red. It's a text. I just put a paint over it, so you will see the, the difference in the in the attribute, and they are symmetric. Y H V H appear one, two, three, four, and Elohim appear one, two, three, four. So Elohim four, Elohim Elohim appeared four times, YHVH four times. So it's a perfectly symmetric thing. Noah is in the middle. So Elohim, both of them assess YHVH assess first mankind, then Noah from her own time, and then Elohim assess Noah and the mankind. So let's see what it shows. Without dwelling too much on that, what what do they tell? What what did the heavenly court say? By the way, you see the protocol. YHVH always speak first in the heavenly court, and she's the why she saw that the evilness evilness. We already mentioned that evil is only in the eyes of YHVH, and here is a proof of that, because the term evil will not fall, will not appear here never. Not in Elohim, but only in, in, in a merciful uh, aspect. So the evilness of Adam was great, and that all the impulse of his heart, and the evil, and evil was all day long. He had, he had all day long walking around with evil thoughts and evil heart. 
She doesn't mention the scene, only the heart and the mind. And, and she regretted that, that the, he or she made Adam on earth and was sudden, and she was saddened. It's an emotional reaction to, uh, to, to her heart. And while she said, I will wipe out the man from the, from the, uh, from uh, uh, whom I made from the face of the earth, because men, for men and cattle and so on. And then she moved on, and Noah found face in the eyes of Hashem. So Hashem speaks, that a bit of mercy speaks only on the human heart. No one can call with that. No one can say, tell me that YHVH is a Jehovah from the from the desert of the Sinai, that the Hebrew, Hebrew God, the bloodthirsty Jehovah. If somebody said that, bring him to the text and show him. You see, the merciful one, why is she, she worried about, she's a merciful one. She's worried about men heart and men evilness. And she doesn't even pay attention to the law. Whereas, and Noah found face in her heart because he, she liked him. He was like her. He was kind, merciful, he was kind to the, he was able to treat, to take care of the animal. Now the Torah move on to Elohim speaking in heavenly court. The opposite. First Elohim speak about Noah, he continued Noah. And he said, and it says, these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a complete righteous, Man, the term righteous is only appearing in the eyes of a king. Righteous means he's winning the, the, the trial. He, he came out from the trial with the upper hand. Rambam said, Rambam said. And, and Noach, with Elohim, Noach walked. And Noach begot a free son, and, and earth was corrupted before Elohim, and the earth filled with Hamas. Corrupted and Hamas, corrupt is a, according to Rashi, is sexual. Hamas is bloodshed and theft. And, and so on. And flesh corrupted on his way against a terrible, uh, terrible uh, uh, sexual thing. Uh, we can talk about the sexual corruption, the Rashi talked about it. And Elohim said to Noah and that. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to wipe out uh, the earth. So, so Noah knew all that. So the only question he had on his mind is, why, why then it happened? Why did it happen? Why did it happen? I'm afraid if I stop that uh, slide, I will lose you. I did a mistake, I turn off the uh, turn off the connection to the internet there. So I, I leave the slide on just because I don't want to lose. Okay. So <clears throat> Noah knew all that. And yet he sit in the he sit in the ark and he's pondering what happened. It means he was he was pondering what brought this. How could it be that mankind would fulfill and become so evil? And if we do all the sin, after three, after three righteous uh, pious generations, something is rotten in human heart, maybe, that could push us to do evil, or what else? So there is some fault in it which he could understand. And that bothered him so much, the rabbi said, he did not want, he became despair. He did not want to bring more children to the world. How do we know that? Because the, the flight was over. Look at the text. The flight was over. The land dried out. He sent the raven back and forth. And 
it seems fine. We even sent a dove and she came back with a leaf of an olive leaf in her mouth, showing him, you know, vegetation is out there. And yet he sit there with his family and he reluctantly to go out. He refused to go out. So the Midrash says, why didn't you go out? One of the rabbis, they were saying, if I were Noah, I would immediately open the door and jump out. The sun and, 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 and the, the trees flew blooming. Wow, why, why, is, why is sitting there in the, in the ark? He's not, it's something strange here. So Elohim noticed that. And the Torah says that Elohim then told him, go out. So here the rabbi said, one of the rabbis said, you know, righteous, Noah was righteous man. He listened to Elohim. So he was told, he had been told by Elohim to enter, and now he's waiting for the command. He will not go out unless he get permission. He's such a nice boy following Elohim order. But now Elohim comes and tell him to go out. And he is not listening. Something is on his mind. Can you hide it from Elohim? No. So Elohim then turned to him and said, No. Go out, you and your wives, right? And your children and their wives. I know what's on your mind. You don't want to bring children to the world? That's why you don't want to go out? <coughs> go out and poke me. Oh, so for me, the rabbi, rabbi actually, we don't say, from here we know what was on in his mind. He was fearful that his, bring, his children now repeat the whole story of Cain and Abel and killing and the whole story of the flood. Because he is now the new Adam. Nama is a new Eve. His three sons are the new children of Cain and Abel. It won't take long that we, we just go out, maybe not our generation, but the next generation. Maybe in the maybe first generation or once you go out, it's kind of we stand up and kill Abel again. Who knows? A rivalry between my between our mouth sons. And the whole story of the flood will come back. And I don't want to see it ever again. I don't want to bring children unless I promise to change. Something will, will change. And I have a hope that the flood will not come out. Otherwise, I will not talk here. That was on his mind. So Elohim saying, no, I'm ordering you to go out. Well, Noah is a righteous man who walked with Elohim. He listened to Elohim. He did go out finally. But he's adamant. There was says there, he went out he and his sons and his wives and there and his son's wife. Meaning we stand on our own view. We are not going to talk here. So the same Noah that listened to Elohim before the flood so much. Uh, that he was righteous person. Yeah, it comes out. I mean, not. I'm not listening to you, Elohim. I'm not bringing children to the world. So, what was in his mind? Uh, we can. The, the Torah doesn't say, but the Torah tell us what he did right after that. And from here, we can learn what was in his mind. Because the first thing he, he did on his mind was he took his family by foot to, to Mount Moriah. 
because Jerusalem will be future of stand. Why Mount Moriah? Because Mount Moriah is where Cain stood up and killed Abel. So now we understand that the whole loop is closed now. He goes there with the first murder to try to stop the whole chain of the downfall from coming back. And Amina speaks so beautifully about how they travel on foot, like a pilgrimage between Mount Ararat in Turkey to, to Mount Moriah. And everywhere they went to so villages and towns, still house full of furniture and even food on the table, but no people. And in fact, no cattle, nothing. Sadly, sadly, they go down that road. I have the feeling that one day, and you can laugh, I don't know, but I have a feeling that Mount Moriah, the road from Mount Moriah to, to, to down to, I mean, the road from Mount Ararat to Mount Moriah will become a pilgrimage for all mankind, people who walk. That, because the connection, it's, it signifies the connection of Noahide to Mount Moriah, to the temple, to, the, to Israel. And, and, and it also shows that Mount Moriah is not just for Israel. Noahide have ownership on the place even before Israel. So Noahide has something to do, claim on, on Mount Moriah. No less than Israel. Israel is only a certain kind of Hebrew. Beautiful thought. Maybe it will happen one day. So as they, as they come to Mount Moriah, the Midrash says, they climb up on the mount, on the mountain, and they identify, Noah identified to his three sons, the stones, the remnant, of the of Cain and Abel altar still stood there for hundreds of years. And he took that stone and he built they built his own altar, square, filled with dirt, with a ramp to the south. Because if I am saying it, because according to the Midrash, this altar would become the prototype of all the other altars that Moses built. In the desert that the, the, the King Solomon built in Jerusalem and Ezra built in, in Jerusalem when they came back. All the altars were square, full of dirt, which went on the south. Because of whom? Because of Noah. So he, he, he took them on, on purpose to show them, you know, my children, this is a danger. This is where all started, all downfall of the flood started here when the first murder. So listen to me. One day you will build, as I said, you will build, you will, one of you will build, build the, here in town, call it the city of peace. Jeru, Jeru, Jeru city, Salem peace, Jerusalem. Build me a city of peace here. Now that fate of the city will depend on you. It can be a source of major bloodshed. And it can be a source of peace. What a prophecy. And he told them, listen, you don't want the flood to come back. So you know what you ought, you ought for peace. <clears throat> and they built the altar. And he also showed them the, the place in the, in the, in the, in the, in the solid uh, stone, the rock that absorbed, that absorbed the blood of Abel into the ground. And the blood actually exited from the southern slope of the mountain 
became a cursed place for hell for, for, for eternity. The blood of Abel. It came out on the southern slope of Mount Moriah. It's hell. You should ask Torah scholar where is hell. He will take you to Jerusalem, show you the southern slope, right, right there. Nobody ever settled in that place until today. Now, as he built there, is he continued the story that we reconstruct now from, from the Midrash and from the Book of Zohar. And he's standing there and, and he, he, he brings on the altar. He had a choice. He can bring, he can bring fruit like kind to show that he's a nice person, vegetarian, or he can show, he can bring animals, like identify himself with Abel, the victim. And he decide, and you can perhaps tell why, he decide to identify with Abel. He bring animals to the horror of his wife. It's a beautiful description here. She is appalled. What are you doing? We took care of those animals for so many months in our walk. We love those animals. We, we know them by name, first name. And you dare to take them and slaughter them for what? You want to stop bloodshed by killing? Are you stupid? What are you doing? But he identified himself as able. So she liked it or not, but she, he, raised it, he raised a knife and standing there thinking, pouring, outpouring his heart. That's why the, 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 the offering that he offered there is called burnt offering. Unlike gift offering, Burn offering, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, said, gift, uh, burn offering, in Hebrew it comes out, it rhymes very nicely. You, you, you offer what is on your heart. You remember, it's amazing that when Cain was about to kill, Hashem told him, kind, sin is crouching at the door of your heart. So what is on your door in your heart, all your tribulation, all your desires, all your secretly, without the word, without the priest listening to you, there's no confession here. That's the special merit of burnt offering, even in temple time. When people brought sin, a uh, uh, burn offering, they did not confess. They didn't say anything to the court, to the priest. Just gave it to him. And he stood there, silence, outpouring the heart. Nobody listened. You don't have to confess. Because sometimes it's so complex. Can you, you cannot even utter it with words. What can you say? So he stood there downloading his heart or uploading if you want his heart on on the on the on the smoke of the heart and as he stand there with a knife he most likely recall in the flesh of his mind what happened here years ago when on that place that spot exactly stood kind and able you can imagine Cain stepping up to the altar proudly, dressing up. He is, he, is a, he is a preferred son of Eve, the beloved son. Everybody likes him. He's strong and beautiful, and he brings veg vegetation. He proudly trot up and offering to Hashem. Eve told him to purchase when she was born, said this kind means to purchase. This man, this boy will purchase 
mankind with, with Hashem. So he purchases the way he will connect Hashem, mankind with Hashem. This was his, his task from Bell. So he's, he's fulfilling his, his mother expectation. By the way, she did, she failed one day, one thing. She did mention Hello Kitty. She said, I purchased a boy with a YHVH. And we already said that she saw a shame in full glory out of the bleeding uterus. She came out with a poor love and emotion and she saw a shame so much that Elohim was actually discarded to the side. And th there is a fault here that probably played out later on in their history. So he comes out as, a, as expected, carrying this vegetable and flowers to Hashem. All, all his peers and sisters and brothers are watching him, admiring him. He is the priest of the family. By him, step up, Abel. He's the opposite of him. Abel was a thin, modest. He, uh, on him, it verse says, after describing the, the big expectation from Cain, the verse says, they yeah. are. And, 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 and also, she bore a boy named Abel. Also, he was also born. It's not important. He was also born there. And the name Abel, Abel, Abel in Hebrew, Abel, uh, the rabbi said was not his right name. Abel means vanity, the breath, the passing breath. So the name the Torah gave him, he gives him. But he, he's passing away without children, like a breath. It's also a sign that he had humility. He didn't think much about him. He's like heaven, nothing. The opposite, exact opposite of God. He's just dragged there, and the Torah says he also offered, offered his, his uh, offering, gift offering. Now, why gift offering? They are going to purchase the connection to Hashem. It's not like Noah is a burn offering. They don't download any emotion. They just purchase thanksgiving or what to, uh, uh, let us connect to Hashem, to love him. Hashem. So Abel was dragged to there by, as if by, by without any special meaning to him, as if, but he was kind and modest. And when it suddenly, when finally it came, uh, the smoke came up, it turned out that Hashem accepted Abel and did not accept kind. How did they know? How did they know about it? Because of smoke. The same, it was the same scenery, the same wind, the same circumstances, but the smoke came up straight up from, from, from altar, from Abel, straight to the sky. Signing that he's accepted. Whereas kind smoke remained hovering over the mountain with a stench. What a humiliation. To kind. So Hashem, and I'm, 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 we are talking now about what, what Noah could have had on his mind at that moment when he lifted the, the knife or the ear. He called, he's called correct, he's going to correct something here. The first, the first, the first uh, offering. Is he going to correct what the, the first murder? So he recalled the scenery. So he, as, as, as he remember from his teaching, from his learning, he learned it, everything from Enosh, his grand grandfather, who learned it, had learned it from Adam and Eve. So he knew the story. And the story went on to say that Hashem noticed the build up of, of, of emotion in, in, in kind heart, because she is all about 
She is listening. She, that is what she's all about. She's listening to human law. So she listened, she, she looked at the kind heart and she said, kind, skin is crunching in the door of your heart. But kind is missing. On the contrary, in, it continued to inflame the hatred. He also, that better just goes on to say, he talked to everyone that how, how stupid this man is, how stupid his brother is, how nothing he stole is a witchcraft. He did something wrong to steal the, the, the primary <coughs> position of him. He stole his priesthood. He is nothing. And, uh, and he continued to flame me to spread, to, to spend, to spread lies about Abel. And Abel was not aware of it. And one day when they were alone on that mountain, on that side, Cain stood up and attacked his un unexpected Abel, a brother Abel, and shocked him with his own hand. He first tried stone, it didn't work. He didn't know how to kill him, but finally he shocked him. And uh, you know the, the way that he tried, he tried, he tried to to use the uh, stone and uh, both all, all the way that he tried it would become the way to execute killer in the in the in the, in the Jewish court by by sword or by, by hanging by stone by <coughs> and so on <coughs> and. Uh, he tried, finally he killed Abel with his own hands. And uh, and, uh, and by this, he completely failed to execute his mission as a priest of Hashem. Now Noah, think, think about it. And he says, I identify with Abel. Cain and his children are no longer able to, to do the task that he was appointed to. So I identify with Abel and I will pick up the way, I will connect my children to Hashem. By Using able way, I'm going to offer able sacrifice, animal sacrifice, like Abel, identify with him, because I know that Hashem, Hashem expected and appreciated, he did appreciate able offering, he listened to Abel. So whatever I was unloading from with my heart, I will support it with the offering that uh, continues the, or identifies with what Abel did. What a great mistake. Because you know what happened? The Torah, the Midrash says, actually, that he did hit it. The knife went down and hit the sacrifice to the hall of his wife. And he felt, he felt, Noah felt good about it. He felt, okay, I accomplished it. I fulfilled, I identified the first, after 10 generations, there was one man here, identified with Abel completely, and I continue to offer what he called, what he offered, sacrifice. And he sat down by the altar three times, and contemplating. As they stood and they sat there, the middle said, something happened. Heavy cloud came from all over and covered the place. And the smoke coming from, from his altar did not go up. Instead, it kept hovering over the mountain with a spreading stench, bad stench of burning flesh. 
shockingly. So the idea that he's gonna the accomplish what Abel would, would have done, completely gone. Abel, because Hashem does, doesn't, Hashem doesn't look at the, at the way you do it, with the animal or vegetable. Hashem look at your heart. Hashem look at the thought of your heart. And I look like Hashem rejected Noah's approach. So he sat down and deflated, completely deflated. And uh, he was thinking now, if that's so, is there any hope if my prayer are not going up? Can we ever stop the flood from coming? Can I stop my, my, can something stop my children from repeating the whole event again? That kind would steal one day again and kill another able. And then the whole generation will deteriorate and the bloodshed and the whole story will repeat. Can I stop it? There's no, no way, even, even my prayer it doesn't help. So what could? And he felt there, said they're completely uh, deflated and said. Now, I think I stop here because uh, uh, the, the next, what next, happened next, I believe God willing for the next class. And if we have a few minutes, uh, if, let's discuss if you have any question or, or, or que about, about what we discussed today. Yes, Rabbi, I have a question. Um, I never thought about the connection between Noah and Adam being like two identical families with three children each, husband, wife, three children. Um, do you, so I have two questions. You said that Abel was a name that was assigned, but that was not really his name. Do you know what his name really was? I think the Midrash may, may mention the name, but it's not so important. I don't remember exactly. Okay. But simply the word Hevel. Hevel, you see, the, the ecclesiastical scroll is, is called in Hebrew. Uh, there is a verse here Hevel, vanity, vanity is vanity. Yeah. So that's, that vanity is in Hebrew, Hevel. So uh, the Midrash then pick up and say, you know, seeing what happened to him and knowing what the character he was. So no, there's no wonder that the Torah actually called him, calls him, Abel. And we know that in the Torah, as a, as a rule, many names are given symbolically. Not yeah. even, even the name of Moses, you know, it's, it's not his, his original name. It's a name that the uh, uh, daughter of Pharaoh gave him and so on. And sometimes it's completely named, it's a co name completely assigned by the Torah to a person. Uh, but the, the real name is somewhere in the middle of I, didn't, I don't remember exactly. That's fine. Um, so my next question is, suppose Cain had not killed Abel, then that generation would not have descended so low that the flood came and destroyed the earth. It could be. Uh, we don't know exactly what, but the, the point in fact, I, I think they have a good answer for that. What Noah thought, and it will be more clear as we speak next time, no, I thought there is a, the fault is not in kind himself or able himself. The fault is in mankind. Mankind is built like an animal, bloodthirsty heart. He really said that in the Rainbow Covenant, yeah. the introduction there. We'll speak about it next week. So mankind has a bloody thirst, bloody uh, first, blood, uh, first bloody heart that we inherited, if you want, from evolution. 
we in the 21st century will say, oh, of course, we, we inherited from all the uh, uh, animals and creatures that preceded us. We repeat the, the entire evolution in our body from, from one cell to a complete uh, human. So we carry the, 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 the way the, the cat, cat, the torture device, uh, we, we carry with us the way that the uh, crocodiles uh, slash flesh or animal kill. And, uh, we carry us uh, the way the, the vegetation uh, is poison. And the whole, the whole fight of life and death, we carry it in us. So we are, so, so that, was, that was on his north mind that regardless your piety, Sooner or later, you will, you will slide down the road, down that slippery road, and you, there is no way to stop it. You will end up with bloodshed. Because, why? Because we are such animals. If that's so, why should he bring children to the world? If we have no escape from that, if we thought, uh, why, sh if I ensure that the Another flood will come. Uh, why should why should I bring uh, children and now that he's sitting by the altar, being rejected? He's even more sure. He is now almost hundred percent sure that there's no way to stop it from happening. That we are indeed bloodthirsty animals, and no way to stop it. And so he's, he's discouraged now. By the way. His offering was rejected. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I look forward to next week. It's uh, it's kind of like a cliffhanger. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the story. Yeah. Okay. So read the text and especially prepare yourself to the, to the whole detail of the Rainbow Covenant. And uh, we are actually, more, next week we will continue to know our thinking about the past. What error was there that we could correct? All right, uh, have a nice week and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay.